blessed. Good, good. Uh, we're going to be looking at what that means as a Christian, as a faithful follower uh, of Jesus Christ. Specifically, we're going to be talking about an anticipated inheritance. Right Now, that doesn't mean uh, anticipate the pastor's going to give you money one day. Right, that, That's not the inheritance that, that we're talking about. Uh, but who in here, let, let's just be honest, who in here anticipates heaven? Right? You think of the day that, that you will be... Uh, be joined with Jesus physically, right? You're going to be with him. So the question is, do you anticipate heaven or do you dread the inevitable? There are other people, even sometimes Christians, who dread what we all will one day face, and that is the day we will take our last breath. Now, the way you answer that question uh, will probably speak a lot about what you truly believe as a person, as a, as a Christian, especially when it comes to, uh, to death and dying and uh, entering into uh, God's glory. Uh, in other words, we ask the question, uh, what, what do you gain or what do we gain, if anything, when it comes to death uh, on the day that we take our last breath? In life, we face seasons of both prosperity and pain. Right? There are times, there are circumstances in my life that everything's going good. Right now in my life, I can tell you, everything's going good. But I can tell you, there are going to be days ahead. I know this because this is, happens to all of us. There are going to be days ahead that it's not going to be so good. Right? There are going to be days in my head, or in my life, in my head, that I'm going to be questioning, what did I do? <laughs> right? We, we all have days like that. We have seasons in our life, such as those. However, as Christians, every moment that we face, no matter if it's good or bad, should be accompanied by the promise of a future inheritance in Jesus Christ. And that means no matter what I'm going through in my life, no matter what I'm facing in my life, I know that there's something to look forward to, right? I know that there is, there is something to anticipate in my future, such an inheritance is not based on merit, earn. it's not based on what I can do, even as a pastor, but rather what he has done for me. What Jesus has done for me. What Jesus has done for you. We see the Apostle Peter, he writes this in, in 1 Peter 1, 3-5, he says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an, here it is, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, in the last day. So do you anticipate the inheritance? Do you anticipate that which Christ has, has given us through the cross? Today, we are going to examine, examine three truths. Uh, or four, I'm sorry, four truths. Not five like last week, but four. So if, if you have, a, many of you have received an outline when you came in, right? I'm going to, I, I always do fill in the blanks. I was informed just a moment ago that we ran out of bulletins. So that means not every one of you has an outline. So here's what you got to do. Look at the person next to you and arm wrestle them, right? No, you don't have to do that, right? We, we'll try to have more next week, all right? Got that, Carmen? More next week. She's got it. All right, so in honor of reading God's word, if you could stand with me here this morning as we examine our text in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. And it says, In him... We have attained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the promise of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the promise of His glory, to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Let us pray. 
Lord gracious, Heavenly Father, again, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that you've allowed us to gather together in your presence. And Lord, we ask that you continue to move in our lives, that you move in our hearts, that you draw us to yourself, that you draw us to your Son. Look, allow us, no matter what season we face today, may it be a season of, of, of splendor, may it be a, a season of, of, of pain or, or prosperity, Lord, that we can look to you and have hope in you and only you. And God, I ask that if there's anyone here today that does not know you as their Lord and personal Savior, they've never placed their faith in you, Lord, we ask that you open their eyes to the truth of your word, that you soften their heart by the power of your spirit, that you draw them to yourself, that you draw them to your Son. And it is in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. So there are four truths that we're going to talk about here this morning as we examine anticipated an inheritance. Uh, first, number one, and you're filling the blank, we see it is an inheritance from Christ alone. From Christ alone. Everything else that you inherit in your life is only temporal. Right? It's only temporal. Right? We, we sometimes strive our whole lives working for the things that are only temporal. Now, you know what temporal means? It'll fade away. Right? It'll fade away. It will not last forever. But that which Christ has offered us as a gift is something that is forever. It is forever. So we see it is an inheritance from Christ alone. Verse 11 of our text, it says this. It says, in Him... Go ahead and read those first two words with me. In Him... Right? Who is Him? Jesus. Right? Jesus. In Him we have obtained an inheritance... A moment ago, we sang uh, a song I really like. I don't know if you, you really like it or not. Uh, here's the problem I've already, uh, already ran into uh, here as your pastor. Okay, so I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I'm telling you this. Um, so some of you may know this, those of you who preached. But when, when you start developing a sermon, the very last thing or the last part of a sermon that you put on your sermon is the title. Right? So that's normally what you do. Well, well, here at First Baptist, you guys want a title like a week ahead before I prepare it. Right? So I'm just winging it and throwing it out there and hoping something sticks. So if I was to rename this sermon, I would probably rename it in Christ alone. Right? Because, because we know it is only in Christ in which we have received or we will receive such an inheritance. I like the song by, by Stuart uh, Toen. He, he, he talks about this. He says... In the words that you just sang, he says, In Christ alone, my hope is found. Have you found hope? Church, have you found hope? And he is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. Jesus is the rock. There are many of us in this room, we've faced seasons again of, of pain and suffering. We face seasons of difficulty and where we've questioned or doubted uh, in our lives. But, but here's, here's the truth. I, I heard this a long time ago. It stuck with me. I love using it. I'm going to use it on you right now, okay? Whenever we feel that we hit rock bottom, just remember, Jesus is the rock, right? Jesus is the rock. So no matter what you're going through in your life, no matter what you're facing in your life, no matter what difficulties you, you may, uh, may come upon, just know that Jesus is that rock. He will get you through. Right? Maybe you're, you're, you're laying on that deathbed one day. Know that Jesus is just around the corner. Right? He will get you through. So what does it mean to obtain an inheritance? We see to gain, it is to gain rightful possession by means of grace. I love that word, don't you? Grace. What is grace? Grace is we've received something that we don't deserve. And some of you... Mark, I mean, some of you really don't deserve it, right? We, I've been talking to your wife, just so you know. Right? So, so the reality is we don't deserve grace, but because of God's love, right? Because of his, his love for us, his desire to, to be with us, to share in that relationship with us, he has demonstrated grace for us, right, on that cross. So it is to gain rightful possession by the means of grace. It is to obtain all rights and benefits of another, that's an inheritance. I don't deserve it. I didn't do anything or I'm not, not uh, 
I didn't merit my way in some form or fashion that, that God owed me. That's grace. It was freely given to me. It is freely given to you. We also see to, to receive, it is to receive favor from the giver of our inheritance. Now, many of you may have received an inheritance from your parents or your grandparents, or, or maybe you're preparing your will. Has anybody uh, wrote up your will? You don't have to raise your hand, right? right? You, you went and had your will wrote up, and, uh, and there's probably something in there for your kids, unless you're like my parents. They're like, we're spending it all. You're not getting anything, right? <laughs> that, that's, that's me. Um, but again... Do we deserve that? Do we earn that? Have we, have we been given that based on merit? No. Why, why have we received that? Or why are we planning to, to pass that on to our children? Is it because they're our children? Is it because we love them? The same thing is true with you and I when it comes to our, our heavenly inheritance, when it comes to that anticipated inheritance. We did not earn it. We are not receiving it by merit, but it was given to us. Why? It's because we are children of God. We are children of God. So we read in the book of Acts, in Acts 20, 32, it says this, and it says, And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. So we see, when we talk about an anticipated inheritance, it is an inheritance from Christ alone. Number two, it is according to His counsel alone. Verse 11 continues of our text. And it says, Having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. So what is the will of God? Many of us have probably asked that question in our own particular lives. Right? What is God's will for my life? What is, what is the will of God? In other words, what, what is the tr chief end of mankind? I like what the Westminster uh, Catechism tells us. It says this, it says, the, chief, the man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Man, I look forward to that day. Are you enjoying Jesus right now? And so, so how is God glorified? When we talk about glorifying God, if that's our chief end, is that, if that's the purpose why God has created us as, as His children, as, as His church, how do we glorify Him? How is He most glorified? It is by His mighty power. There's nothing that I can do outside of God that can make Him more glorious than He already is. It is all about Him. It's, as we talked about last week, it's not about me. It's about what He has done. It's not about what I have done or what I can do. So it is by His mighty power. It's by His messianic plan. You know, even before the foundations of the world, God had a plan to save you from your sins. You're thinking, well, pastor, I wasn't around. That doesn't matter. God was, right? He was. So we see, we see it is by His mighty powers through His um, messianic plan. And number three, we see it is by mankind's praise. Mankind's praise. I like, I like what author John Piper says about this. He says this. He says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Are you satisfied in Jesus? Right now. I mean, there, there are a lot of times in our life that we become dissatisfied, right? Dissatisfied. We, we, maybe we got up too early in the morning. Look a little grumpy here today, right? You all look beautiful, just to say, right? I don't see anyone who's, who's grumpy right now. Maybe that person up there on the top row. But, but the rest of you, you're, you're good, right? So God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Only through the Lord's mighty power can His messianic plan come to completion. It is only then will all of mankind praise Him with both honor and glory. Why do we... We talked about in Sunday school... This morning, worship. Did anybody else talk about worship? Some of you are on the same curriculum that we were. Right? We talked about worship. Worship, when we talk about worship, worship is always a response to God. Right? Many of us think that worship, we come here, we sing a little song, a few songs. You know, it's that it makes us feel good. But again, worship's not about you. 
It doesn't matter if you walk away feeling sorry for yourself. That's okay. Why? Because it wasn't about you, right? It's about Jesus, right? It's, it's about him. It's about what he has done in our life, what he is doing in our lives. We read in the book of Proverbs, it says, many are the plans of the, in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. So it's not about my plan. Anybody here have a plan? Kids are getting ready to go off to school, right? They're about ready to start back at school. They're planning their, you know, they, they have their classes all lined up. I know my daughter is really nervous. Right, she's probably going to be really mad at me after I talk about her. But she's nervous, right? It's a bigger school. Uh, I, I forgot how many was in Greenfield, but I think the freshman class here in, in Morton is probably bigger than the whole high school where she's coming from. So, so it's significantly different in size. She's going to have to take speech. Does anybody here have to take speech? All right, some of you, right, some of so the guys up there, they have to take speech. All right, she is nervous, all right, nervous about speech. All right, when uh, first Sunday here, they went up to, uh, to Sunday school, and Dan made all the kids give a speech, right? Her first Sunday here, and, and he was just prepping her, getting her ready for high school, right? Is, is what, he was, what he was doing. But again, we have all these plans, and we can plan out our future. We can plan out our career. We can, we can make all these plans, but you know what? Our plans don't mean nothing. It's about his plan. It's about his plan for my life. It's about his plan for your life. Uh, there's an old saying. Uh, I think it comes from a, a song. Many of you probably know this. And you can, you can entertain me here for a moment. And the, here, and, and the thing is. God is good. In all the time. See it doesn't matter what church you're in. Everybody knows that. Right? Everybody knows that. But here's, here's a question I want to ask you about that. Do you believe it? Do you really believe that? That God is good. All the time. Because we believe that when things are going good for us, or at least in our mind, but do we believe God is still good when things are going really bad? Do we believe God is good when we lose our job? Do we feel that, that God is still good when we lose a loved one to cancer? Do we, do we really think that God is good? Do we believe that God is good when we wreck our car? Or when we get that big fat F on our uh, report card? Do we really believe that God is still good? Good, Because here's the deal. It's not about our plan that makes it good. It's about God's plan. And even in our darkest seasons, even in our lives where we face pain and suffering, know that God is still good. And He's still working in our lives. He's still working in our heart. He's still working through that season of difficulty. So it is only through the Lord's mighty power can His messianic plan come to completion. That means I can't do it. You can't do it. Only Jesus can. Right? Only Jesus can. It is only then will all of mankind praise and honor Him. So again, God is good. And all the time. I've oftentimes uh, reflected on God's will and what that really means. And it, it's it's. One of those things in Scripture, I don't, I don't know if any of you have ever ran into this where you've struggled with something in Scripture. Have you ever done that? Or at least struggled to understand it. All right, when it comes to the Trinity, who in here fully understands the Trinity? I don't think there's one person in here, including myself, that fully understands it. Do I believe in it? Absolutely. Uh, it's scriptural, but, but we can throw out analogies and all that, but all of our analogies fall short when it comes to truly explaining and understanding the, the vastness of God. Uh, I think the same thing is true when it comes to God's will. And the only way I've been able to explain it is to know that God has what I call, I don't know if this was really a theological term, but this is Ben's term, right? Is God's dual will. All right, God's dual will. So what is God's dual will? All right, let me, let me test you here for a second. We're going to see how much of, uh, of the Bible do you, do you know. Uh, who in here believes that it is God's will for you not to sin? You can raise your hand. You don't have to blurt out or anything, right? For those of you who aren't raising your hand, right, you're just living like heathens right now, aren't you? <laughs> so, yeah, it's God's will. He, he does not want you to go out and murder your husband, right? That would be bad for your husband, right? He, he doesn't want, 
want you to go out and uh, rob a bank, right? I'm buying a house, but I'm, that temptation, I know I'm not going to do that, right? He, he knows uh, that there are things in our life that we know God does not want us to do. So it would be safe to say that God's will is for us not to sin. And let me ask you this question. Who in here believes it was God's will to send his son to the cross for you? To die on the cross? Do you know what that was? Jesus was murdered. So are we saying it was God's will for people to murder someone? We just said that wasn't the case. Do you understand that? I don't if you do inform me, right? Because that's one of those things, it's those concepts that's hard for us to grasp. But, but I think it opens a bigger picture of helping us understand even when things, even evil things take place in our life and around us, we know that God still can use that he can still use those seasons in our life. He can use those, even those bad people in our life to do his will, right? To work his, his work and his power through and in our life. And if you want to have a conversation more about that, um, talk to Richard. Uh, but uh, <laughs> So we see, we see Peter tells us, he says, but, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we see it is an, an anticipated inheritance. It is an, an inheritance from Christ alone, according to his counsel alone. And number three, in fulfillment of his covenant alone. That word came up this morning in Sunday school. We talked about a covenant. You know what the word covenant means? It's a promise, right? Who in here has ever made a promise? You raise your hand. I'm very interactive if you, if you haven't uh, discovered that already. I got to make sure you're staying awake, right? I, I, I see people nodding off. So I got to make sure you're, you're awake, right? So who in here, at the same, same time, go ahead and raise your hand if you've ever made a promise, right? Keep your hand up. Who in here has ever broke a promise? Put your hand down. That's what I thought, right? All of us have made promises. All of us have broken promises. But here's the good news. God will never break a promise. Right? He, will, he will never break a promise. And we see this throughout the scriptures. We see this uh, in the Bible. It, it says in verse 12 of our text, so, it says, So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. God's people received hope. In Christ, by the fulfillment of God's promise expressed to them through the covenants, plural, covenants, in which the Lord had made with them. We see this throughout the scriptures, throughout the Old Testament. Now, I told you I only had four points today, but we're going we're gonna to start in Genesis, and we're going to go all the way through the Bible, okay? Are you ready? You didn't come prepared for that, did you? Well, we'll make it as quick as possible. There are five covenants we see throughout Throughout the scriptures, number one is what is called the creation covenant. It is the covenant that God had made with Adam. Uh, the book of Genesis starts with God. It says, in the beginning, who was there? God. God. Where did God come from? He's always been. Right? God is the only uncaused cause. Right? He, is, he, he has always been. So we see, in the beginning, God. It was God who created all things. It was for him alone that all things were created. It was on the sixth day that God created humanity. Humanity was, he was made different than any other thing, any other creature that God had created. Did you know that you're different? Some of you are really different, but the rest, we're, we're all different, right? You're different than your dog, right? You're different than your cat. You're different than your little goldfish, right? right? You're, you're, you're different than that. Right? How are you different? Here's how we're different. Not just different because we look different. Because we have the ability to have a relationship with our creator. My dog doesn't even know God exists. Well, in reality, my dog probably thinks that my daughter's God. right? Because she sneaks, sneaks, them, or sneaks her food under the table. I know what happens, Abby. Right? So, so, but the reality is, we have... We have a connection. We can have a relationship with our creator. 
with our Creator. So on the sixth day, sixth day, humanity was created. So what does this mean? It means, again, as stated, as uh, out of all creation, humanity was given the ability to personally know God. By knowing God, he was able to care for all of creation. The Lord commanded of him to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth and subdue it. The only way we can do that is by knowing God. Right? It is through him. Humanity was meant to be someone special, set apart from everything else, everyone else. However, he was to be, be fully reliant on the Lord. The only way I can live out my purpose, to live out that life that God has given me to live, is if I am dependent on Jesus. Right? If, I'm, if I'm dependent on him within my life, but I know I've fallen short, from the glory of God, but we know that from Romans, we know that from, from our own personal lives. But God, even way back when, made a promise. And here's the promise. Genesis, uh, Genesis, and you don't have this overhead, so just to warn you, I threw it in there. Uh, Genesis 3.15 says this. It says, God is speaking at this point to the serpent. And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What, what is this passage? What is God talking about here? Here in scripture, this is the very first messianic prophecy that is ever made. And basically what this passage, this verse is, is saying, it's, it's promising that although we messed up, although humanity messed up, God's going to send the Redeemer, right? He is going to send a Redeemer. So we see the, the creation covenant. Next, we see the noetic covenant. Uh, as we move beyond the garden, we see a great change within the world. Most of us could probably flip on the TV and we still see this change taking place. And what is it? It's the world in which we live in seems to be getting wickeder and wickeder, right? We see darkness all around. We see bad things all around the world. For it is written, it says the Lord saw the, he saw the wickedness of man. He saw that it was great in the earth and that every intention of their thoughts of his heart was only to do evil. It was only evil. So the Lord God said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. However, the Lord renewed His promise. Remember I said God doesn't break promises. He renewed His promise, His covenant with Noah. We see this in, in Genesis 9. It says, And God blessed Noah. You remember what the word blessed means? Happy. <laughs> right? Right? I don't know, but if uh, God destroyed us in a flood, that wouldn't, be very, wouldn't make me feel very happy, right? But it says, It says, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Uh, verses 8 through 9, it continues, says, Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. So we see the, the creation covenant, we see the noetic covenant, and next we see the Abrahamic covenant. It says in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, it says, here we have, Abraham, used to go as Abram, right, real short, that was his nickname, right, Abram, right, he, uh, he is hanging out at home and all of a sudden, what happens? The Lord calls him out. Now, we don't know Abraham's past. We, we can make assumptions that he probably, uh, he probably, like the people in his culture, probably worship other gods, like other people in his culture, but God saw something, and it wasn't anything specifically from Abram himself, but it was what God was going to do through him. The same thing is true when you and I come to faith in Christ. It's not because God sees something and says, man, Jason, that's going to be an outstanding follower. Right? It's in spite of him. It's in spite of me that God calls me, and he, he delivers me from my sin through faith and faith alone by grace. So we see it goes on and says, God speaks to Abram and he says, he says, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land in which I will show you and I 
will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families, get this, get this part right here, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Do you know what that means? It is through Abram. It is through Abraham that God would send forth that Redeemer. It is through him that he would bless all nations and all people. Not just Israel, but even Gentiles like me and like you. So we see, we see the Abrahamic covenant. Number four, we see the, the Mosaic covenant. It says the Lord used Moses not only to deliver Israel from the land of Egypt. Many of us have We've heard the story, we've listened to that story, but, but he used Moses in order to bring back his people. Remember, there was 400 years that the people of Israel, that the Hebrew people were in bondage. There, were, there was a 400 year gap. Now, if I lived in a land, or my ancestry lived in a land for 400 years, we're probably going to pick up a few, a few things. Right? Well, Egypt was a polytheistic Nation, what does that mean? They worshiped many gods, many gods. So even, even Israel at that point began to adapt these, this idol worship. They, they began to adapt this. So God wasn't just redeeming the people or delivering the people from Egypt, but he was drawing them back to himself. He was, he was drawing them back to himself. They would, they would be his people and he would be their God for eternity. We see this in, in Exodus 6-7. Israel would, would soon be despised and rejected by the people of Egypt, but the Lord would free them from their bondage. This would take place by God making himself known to his people. He would make himself known. John Butler, he says this, he says, Israel's deliverance was to be, it was to be accomplished by an increase in the knowledge of God. Right? God was showing himself to his people. Why? Why did he do this? So that they could have a relationship with him. But there's still a problem with Israel, and there was still a problem even in our lives today, and that problem has been the same ever since humanity began. And the problem is sin. It is sin. It was on the mountain of Sinai, Mount Sinai, that, that the Jewish people... Um, as well as every other nation, would discover their need for a Savior through the Decalogue. Does anybody here know what the Decalogue is? I'm going to throw some weird words out at you, right? You, you know what it is. It's the Ten Commandments, right? So the question is, why did God give Israel the Ten Commandments if God knew in His foresight, He knew that they would fail? Why? Here's why I believe God had, had given the Ten Commandments. It was not necessarily because he, the, the people were going to be able to keep it and follow it and, and do all of that. It, that. That's part of it, but we know they fail. But here's why. It was to show the people the standard of God's holiness and to teach them that they would fail. That they couldn't do it. So it was to show them that they needed a Savior. We see that throughout history. We see uh, Israel as well in our generation. People try, try, and try. We try to work our way to God, but we, we fall short. We fall short. God knew this, but we don't. We, uh, we somehow miss that at times, but God knew this. And it was through that that God was foreshadowing the one in whom would come, and he would be perfect. He would fulfill that which was written in the, the prophets and in the law. And we see this in the new covenant, number five in your, in your uh, list of covenants. It says in Romans 7, 6, Paul writes, he says, But no, we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in a new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What does that mean? You can't be saved by just being good or doing good things because you're not good enough. I'm not good enough, but Jesus is. In Romans 6, 14, it says, this is, For sin will have no dominion over you since you are no longer under law, but what? 
under grace. Under God's grace. So we anticipate the inheritance. Why? It's because it is an anticipate, it is, we, we anticipate it because it is an inheritance from Christ alone, according to his counsel alone, in fulfillment of his covenant alone, for the purpose of his credit alone. He receives the credit, not me. He receives the credit, not you. Verse 13 and 14. It says this, it says, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of His glory. Again, He gets the glory, not me. He gets the glory. The inheritance is not something I've earned, but, it, but it's something that is freely given to me because of Him. It is only through faith in Christ that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, that we are secure in our inheritance, and that we are sanctified or satisfied in the Lord. Are you satisfied in Jesus Christ? Are you satisfied in what, what the Lord is doing in your life and what He is, he is continually doing in your life? In, a few minutes ago before the service, I went into the nursery. I was looking for a toy. Yes, pastor's looking for a toy in the nursery. And I don't know if you're, I couldn't find one, but I'll describe it to you. Most of you probably know uh, what I'm going to describe. But it was, it was a little box or like a round ball and had a bunch of different shaped holes in it. You remember that when you were a kid? It has been around for a long time, right? And, and, and there was these, bo- these blocks. You had to find the correct shape and, and you had to put it in the right hole. You remember that, Richard? I, I heard you had one in your office, but I didn't see it, right? So, so when he gets stressed out, that's what he plays with, right? Uh, but the reason I was looking for that, because it, it, it helps me understand that, that we have a God-shaped hole in our heart. And many times in our life, we try to find things to, to, to fill that hole. We try to f- find all kinds of things to fill that hole, but no matter what we look for, no matter what we try to force in there, nothing fits. Nothing satisfies. Only Jesus can satisfy. So again, are you satisfied in Jesus? If not, something is out of place. Something is out of place. Either Jesus isn't enough for you, your will is valued over God's will, you've become distracted by the storm or the foundation in which your faith has been planted is wrong. Rather, you're trusting, you're trusting in what you can do rather than what the Lord has done for your life. To seek, to, to seek gain, to, to seek material gain is to lose eternal glory. But God seeks, he, he seeks the grace. We, we are to seek the grace of God in order to gain an inheritance that will never end. No matter what I face. No matter what you face. It is an eternal fulfillment of joy. It is an eternal fulfillment of satisfaction in our lives. Such fulfillment does not come from... Now, I want you to listen to me real carefully. Because I'm going to say this statement and you're going to think, that's heresy, right? But, but I want you to listen real carefully. It is inheritance that does not come from God, a created means in which He has produced, but it is found only in Himself through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That means God's created a lot of things, but those things don't bring me purpose. Those things don't bring me full satisfaction. It is only in Him. It is only in the Lord. It is an inheritance from Christ alone, according to His counsel alone, and fulfillment of His covenant alone, for the purpose of His credit alone. We have hope in a future inheritance, even when the present appears to be falling apart. Years ago, over 15 years ago, to be exact, I remember my wife and I, we were expecting uh, our first child, our first child. So we, uh, we were excited. It was a few weeks off. We went to the doctors and, uh, for one of her last checkups uh, before the big day. 
and we got to the, the doctor's office and the doctor didn't like uh, her blood pressure, was a little high. So they decided it would probably be best if they induced her and went ahead and uh, took my, my daughter uh, two weeks early. It was just two weeks, so it wasn't a long period of time. So, so we we're okay. We weren't expecting that, but, but okay, we can handle that. So, uh, so we went back to the house, grabbed her suitcase and everything, went to the hospital, and they went through all the process and all of that. And I remember, I remember uh, standing there, and I was beside the hospital bed, and the nurse came in, and, and she took her uh, little listening thing, right? <laughs> she, and, and she began to uh, listen for the baby's heartbeat. And I remember standing there, and she began to, you know, put the stethoscope. That's what it's called, correct? All right, just make sure. Thank you. Right, she put the stethoscope uh, on there on her, and she was listening and listening. Didn't hear anything. And then she was moving around a little more, other places, because babies move, right? She was listening to other places. Didn't hear anything. Now, for me, I'm standing there, and I remember just as clear as day, even today, I remember I could tell you exactly what that nurse looked like because she lifted her head and she looked at me. And when she looked at me, I saw fear in her eyes. That's never anything you want to see from your medical physicians. I saw fear. And at that moment, I felt helpless. I had no control. Here at this moment, my daughter may be gone. Here at this moment, there was nothing that I could do to save her. But they found the heartbeat. Amen? My daughter's over there. So you, you know she survived, right? You know she survived. But I, I tell you this story because there, there are times in our life where we feel helpless. And if you're like me, you like to be in control, right? You, you like to be in control. You like to, to, to know that you can handle it. You can handle the situation. But when things get out of hand and, and things get beyond our control we begin to panic. We begin to panic and we begin to lose sight of the one who's in control. Even through that, that time in my life, even in times of your life when we struggled, when we faced pain, when we faced suffering, know that God is still in control. And He has promised us that through His Word. He has shown that to us and we can anticipate the inheritance. We can anticipate there will be a day with no more pain. There will be a day with no more suffering. There will be a day with no more sin. Amen. Amen. There will be a day of future inheritance. It is an inheritance that we all, through Christ, can anticipate. Let us pray. Lord gracious, Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord, for this time together. I thank you for, for this this day that you've allowed us to gather, Lord, and to study your word. And Lord, I know it's been a lot. I know we've uh, covered a lot here today. And, and Lord, no matter where we are in our lives, no matter what we face in our lives, Lord, I, I know that you know. I know you know the, the days of plenty. You know the days of, of, of difficulty. And Lord, I ask that you continue to move and help us see the hope that is found in you. Help us remain satisfied in what's to come, not in, in what we face, what we uh, have gained temporarily, Lord, but, but what will last for eternity? And Lord, we know the things of this world will fade away, but Lord, you are forever. And Lord, we trust in you and thank you for all you do and all you're going to do in our lives and through this church. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Please stand and let's sing together.